Welcome to Gary DeMar's Vantage Point, where national and world events are analyzed through the superior lens of a Christian worldview. We concluded our last segment discussing the Ground Zero Mosque and whether or not there is a place for mosques in a free Christian republic. Today, we'll continue our discussion of Islam and Christianity and their place in our current secularist nation. Vantage Point is brought to you by American Vision. For more about the topic of today's show, check out the Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam. You will find it at AmericanVision.com. Well, I've got a, I've got a great uh, direction to take this debate, and that is this uh, New York State exam, the Regents exam. Uh, the headline came out in the New York Post that a high school test is slamming Christianity and lauding Islam. Mm -hmm. Let me read a passage to you from this test. Wherever they went, the Muslims brought with them their love of art, beauty, and learning. From about the 8th to the 11th century, their culture was superior in many ways to that of Western Christendom. Meanwhile, an excerpt listing the common pr procedures used by Christian friars to introduce the religion in Latin America stated that, quote, idols, temples, and other material evidences of paganism were destroyed, unquote, and Christian buildings, quote, were often constructed on sites of destroyed native temples and built with free Indian labor to boot. So here you have, again, this culture war, the left promoting Islam uh, mm -hmm. sure. against Christianity. It's not, they're not being neutral. The left has always been against Christianity. There's, there's one thing that the secular humanists and the Islamists have in common, is that they would both rather have a secular humanist government in place than a Christian government. Because that, to them, they both have the, 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 a, a, a straight road to what they want to accomplish. There's a power that vacuum that they can fill. Sure. Well, they can always change the law. Since they're, since they're the creators and the interpreters of the law, they right. can always change it. But, but since it's this tolerance and diversity, that gives an open door to this Muslims to use the front of being a religion of peace to practice their their you know their more activist forms, uh, which is going on. There's a great book by uh, Peter Hammond on Islam, where he talks about the percentage of the population in lo lo local places, local governments. That the, the greater it grows as of Muslims, uh, the further and further they press for their Sharia rights. You know, when they get to two percent, they start wanting you know. Uh, uh, their own places for halal foods and whatnot, and when they get to 5% of the population, then they start asking for, well, let us just have our own Sharia courts for our people, and then if they get to 10%, then it, they start agitating for, for Sharia. And, it, and it's happened. You can look at the statistics, percentage of Muslim populations all over the world, and they line up exactly with what he's talking about. The greater the percentage gets, the more they want government control. They always want government control, just like the secular humanists do. But it's the secular humanists that give them the open door to begin that under this front while well, they're a religion of peace. And that's what's going on right now in these kind of textbooks. They keep, you know, fostering these false ideas that there's no radicalism, it's just a tiny percentage. Well, well they're trying to create this accommodation deal. You know, if you, we're going to be real nice, and if we're real nice, you'll be real nice in return. But that isn't the history mm -hmm. of Islam. Even in our own country, you can go back to the end of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th century, America was at war with uh, Islamic elements in the, the Trip uh, Tripoli area in northern Africa, the Straits of Gibraltar, where uh, these mu Muslims were, were commandeering ships, taking people off those ships, turn, putting them into slavery. And we fought a war you know, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Now, there's a reason for that. And so the idea that it's a religion of peace there are peaceful elements into it, and there is this issue of science and so forth. But if you go back and you really study it, you'll find that Islam borrowed that from other uh, fr from other cultures. It wasn't mm -hmm. something that was that was uh, basic to their own. Okay, last thing. Well, let me let me add this on. There's an interesting tie between what that particular aspect of that book was talking about mm -hmm. and what's going on in New York, and that's the whole idea of of southern Spain. You know, they didn't come in as these peaceful people. They say in, wherever they went, it was about art and culture. No, they stormed southern Spain, took over the culture, right. tore down a, a church a that church. was built in Cordoba, mm -hmm. <laughs> and turned it into a mosque, and then ruled the place with Sharia for 500 years before it was uh, regained by the Catholics. So don't tell me it was peaceful. Yeah. And now they're wanting the name of this mosque, the Cordoba House in New York City. We all know what that means. Uh, the next topic is a seminary in California of all places, no big surprise, a Methodist seminary that is now training imams and rabbis. What do you think of this? 
a seminary grad yourself. <laughs> well, it depends on what they're training them in. If yeah. you're training them in the gospel and how the, how the Bible applies to every area of life and you need a change of heart, uh, I think that's a good thing. Uh, but if they are trying to create some sort of uh, pluralism where these, where these religions, we're going to show the commonality uh, among the three religions and you'll live in peace with your religion and you will live in your peace with your religion and so forth and try to attempt to do that, I think it's, of course, unbiblical to do so, but I think it's also terribly naive to think uh, that, especially in terms of Islam, that that's going to work long term because lo Islam has long term uh, the goal to subvert all religions and, to, to, as, as I heard on the radio the other day, is to turn the world into a mosque. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. Absolutely, and this ties into everything we've been talking about. They love secular humanist nations like the United States because it gives them an open door to, to do their subversion. Uh, and of course, Claremont, it's about as, as liberal as a seminary can get. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong about this, but I think that's where the Jesus seminars started. You know, these are the liberals of the liberals. They're the worst of the worst. So, I mean, I'm not surprised at all that this is going on. It's, it's part of this whole diversity idea. And, and it's just an open door for Islam. I mean, you, you, you see they have, I think, 0.6% of the population in the United States now, but as they, they, they're concentrated in certain places. And as those grow, you're going to see more and more uh, social pressure and then political pressure to impose uh, Islamic ideas. Uh, ultimately, Sharia law, it's going to happen. Well, as I mentioned in the last segment, uh, we welcome your emails. We have an email here from Kerry. How does Sharia law differ from what the Apostle Paul calls Christians to do in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Gary, do you have that passage? Yeah, this is, it's a great point, and I'm, I'm surprised this hasn't been brought up yet, but I, I've given, maybe I'm not surprised because many evangelicals really don't see the use of, of biblical law as an application to all of life. We've got, that's in the Old Testament, we don't deal with that anymore. But the, Paul, but the Apostle Paul makes this great point in 1 Corinthians 6, and he says, does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? And mm -hmm. the Muslim is saying the same thing. Why would we want to go to your secular court to deal with things that, that only can be understood in terms of Islamic law? Uh, Paul goes on to say in verse 2, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Mm -hmm. And if the world is judged by you, uh, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that you shall judge angels? how much more matters of this life, uh, which is an astounding statement. Paul says, look, there is this, we don't know all the implications of judging angels. But Paul says, look, if you're geared for this in the future, why, isn't that you, why aren't you being trained right now among yourselves to, to deal with matters of this life? Verse 4, if then you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, well, aren't, aren't the Muslims saying the same thing. This is what Sharia law is all about. Uh, yes and no. Uh, since there is no jurisdictional separation between church and state uh, among uh, in Islam. Muslim in, in Islam, but, but there is a jurisdictional separation between church and state and Christianity, this makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Um, and there, there are certain things that don't require uh, civil sanctions. If, if Joel and I have a dispute over a piece of property or some contract uh, and uh, we're, here we are Christians, the, the, we, we wouldn't have to go to, to court over this. Why couldn't the church, uh, if we belong to a church body that has uh, elders in that church who apparently are supposed to be competent, they're supposed to be teachers of the law as, as, as well, uh, first, uh, I think 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, states that. You go back to uh, Exodus chapter 18, those who were picked, Absolutely. you have to know God's law. And so instead of us going to court, getting a lawyer, taking up the court's time, why couldn't, why couldn't the church simply deal with this reconciliation, whatever the elders of the church said about this? But in terms of capital crimes, the church doesn't have jurisdiction. That is a civil issue, and that is something that civil courts need to, need to deal with. Absolutely. I mean, you're talking about an agreement, essentially, in the Christian circles, where it would be an agreement where if, if we came to a dispute, we would settle it ourselves through Christian arbitration and some sort like that. Uh, you are not talking about essentially being a replacement for civil punishment, right. which in many cases is what Sharia does. You know, the example is much talked about is you, for theft, you might have a hand cut off, right? Whoever determines that, I don't know. But, you know, you couldn't get away with that in a Christian court. Uh, 
like Paul's talking about, and we wouldn't want to. The whole point is settling disputes in an amicable manner, letting love rule among the brethren, uh, but not imposing civil sanctions. That's always the prerequisite of the civil government. Oh. And, 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 and by the way, it, it doesn't mean that the civil magistrate doesn't come under the umbrella of God's law. There right. are laws that question. are specifically right. designed for the civil magistrate. Civil magistrate has legitimacy uh, under, under, under the, the, in, in the world because uh, God has instituted civil government. I mean, the civil magistrate in, in Romans chapter 13 is called a minister of God. It's the right. same word that's used of a deacon in a church. He's yeah. a servant of God. Therefore, his determination of what constitutes good and what constitutes evil in Romans 13, 4, how does he determine that? Mm -hmm. uh, is it arbitrary? Is it, you know, left up to himself? Do you have councils and so forth? Uh, so family, church, and state all under the jurisdiction of God's government, but they are jurisdictionally separate. Uh, families deal with family government and family laws. Churches deal with church government, church laws, and the state deals with civil government and civil laws. And an important distinction, I think, is the Christian ideal is bottom-up which is why Moses had it set up in Exodus 18 the way he did. There were judges over tens and fifties and hundreds and all the way up to the top. You know, the, the ideal is that you never have to use those top judges for anything. Uh, but of course, it, once in a while you do. Uh, but I think the Islamic uh, version is to grab the same reins of power and impose this on people even if they're unwilling and if they don't comply, drive them out, which is what history is borne out over and over and over. Uh, granted, Christian history is shown its share of that as well. Sure. So has secular humanist history, by the way. Uh, but uh, that is not the Christian ideal, and I don't think Islam can make that same claim. Can we get back to the mosque for one minute here? Because America founded as a Christian nation, even though it may not be explicitly Christian today, mm -hmm. was founded as a Christian nation. If Christians were to recapture civil government, and, and we had Christians and leaders of power, Congress, President, even on the local level, which is very important, would we then allow legally, okay, a mosque to be built in America? That, that is the question I want to see. I want to get your answer on that. Well, it would be a question over whether they can own property or not. And to own property, you would have to be a citizen. Uh, to be a citizen, you would have to take an oath to uphold the Constitution. And if the co Constitution uh, required religious test oaths uh, to be in office, uh, it would essentially be... The state constitutions do, is that right, some of them? They used to, not so much, not anymore. Yeah, so I, I honestly haven't thought that far through the issue. Uh, but the statement I always make, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tough scenario to paint that, that, that scenario to begin with because my vision is not Christians being in all the seats of power that are there now. If they were, <laughs> their main goal would be to resign and to close down the institution. I always say if, if, if my theonomic vision had its, had its way to the largest rollback of government in right. human history. What government we would have, though, would be thoroughly Christian. Uh, right, I mean, but you wouldn't see any policies being made from Washington, D.C. The policies that, are, that should be in place, there are only limits on what that government can do, and they're very, very tiny. Uh, and, and those decisions would make it at a lo hopefully a local level rather than a state level. That is the first, the first Amendment says Congress shall make no law. Right. And the reason the that was, that was put in there by the states, because the states did want to be able to make these laws, so it would be a state determination. And if you had a religious group over here that wanted to subvert and overturn the Constitution of the United States and imp imp uh, implement Sharia law top-down civilly, uh, then that's a problem. Yeah. And uh, so, anyway, I, I think that the, these, these mosques, at least as we understand Islam today, uh, is something of, a, of an ideological uh, Trojan horse. So, mm. Oh, there's no doubt about well that. Said. No doubt. Well, thank you again for joining us on Gary DeMar's Vantage Point. Please send your emails to vantagepoint at americanvision.org, and we'll see you next time. For more about the topic of today's show, check out the highly rated title, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam and the Crusades written by best-selling author and columnist Robert Spencer, president of Jihad Watch. This book is an enormous amount of research that bursts the myths and the lie of a religion of peace by revealing the ongoing unshakable quest for global domination and why the West still faces the threat of Islamic takeover. You will find this great companion guide to the Middle East at AmericanVision.com. From the top. Please leave that in on the outtakes. Oh yeah, it's recording. <laughs>